And the train will not stop going. We all knew it was oncoming. Rhodium has now hit $6,000 per ounce. Along with some other things we're going to talk about this week, the monthly U.S. shale data came out. Norway's oil production went surging upwards. And this winter, looking like it's going to be another heavy one for natural gas consumption. So hello and welcome back, everybody. We're here with another weekly energy and resource update episode. Energy and resources, oil, gas, minerals, mining, and all their corresponding events and data releases over the course of the past week. So if you're new and you're remotely interested in all that kind of stuff, then please subscribe and hit the bell and stick around here. And or if you're not new and you want to support the channel and really me as I'm about to lose my job in less than three weeks, then please use the paypal.me down below. Anyone who gives any amount will get their name carved into a giant chunk of coal come Christmas time. But here we go regardless. Getting right into the usual weekly data, U.S. oil production remains the same as last week, 12.8 million barrels per day. The amount I had indeed expected it to reach before the end of the year. That was one of a small handful of successful calls I had. Most of those you can see in the uh, 2019 Energy and Resources Prediction video that appears up in the corner. U.S. oil consumption drops a little bit, down to 21.2 million barrels per day. Individual products within that for this past week are gasoline consumption coming in at 9.19 million barrels per day, diesel fuel consumption coming in at 4.32, and jet fuel consumption for the U.S. coming in at 1.66. And on the broader scale outside, global jet fuel consumption, which does include U.S. jet fuel consumption in it, Global jet fuel consumption for this past week averaged 5.4 again. U.S. crude oil inventories went up by a small bit, up by 1.4 million barrels. And oil prices fluctuated between $55 and $59 per barrel, decreasing over the earlier part of the week before, as the later part came on, increasing back up towards 58 U.S. natural gas production is up to 108.4 billion cubic feet per day definitely exceeding my initial expectations that it would get up to at least 104 before the end of the year. And U.S. consumption for this past week averaged 104.2. Individual numbers within that overall consumption were heating demand coming in at 36.5 billion cubic feet per day, consumption by natural gas-fired power plants coming in at 21.6, U.S. natural gas exports on LNG tankers coming in at 7.2, and consumption by the natural gas pipeline system for its own pumping fuel coming in at 7. U.S. natural gas storage inventories dropping down a week earlier than normal, beginning their drop down this week down to 3.64 trillion cubic feet in storage. In comparison to normally on average, they would still be up at 3.7. And last year, which was a very high demand winter year, they were down at 3.13. Natural gas prices over the course of the week stayed between $2.50 and $2.70 per thousand cubic feet, mainly staying on the lower end for most of the week before upshooting right towards the end. And as mentioned, we have the monthly shale data. The ever prominent Permian shale continues to climb upwards from 4.55 up to 4.67 million barrels per day, with my expectation remaining that it's gonna peak most likely between 5.8 and 6.2. Permian natural gas output increased over the month from 15.87 up to 16.27 billion cubic feet per day. The Appalachia shale increased again over the month from 33.17 up to 33.67 billion cubic feet per day, with my expectation for the Appalachia shale that it's going to peak anywhere between 36 and 42, with a more likely leaning towards 37 to 39. The Eagle Ford shale remained flat at 1.38 million barrels per day, and its natural gas output remained basically flat, decreasing by a tiny bit from 6.89 down to 6.88 billion cubic feet per day. The Bakken shale continues to make little climbs upwards, up to 1.5 million barrels per day flat, and its natural gas output hanging just under 3.1 billion cubic feet per day. The Haynesville natural gas shale over the course of the month, climbing from 11.7 up to 11.39 billion cubic feet per day, with my expectation as it has been being that its peak will come between 12 and 13. The Anadarko shale spread out over Oklahoma increased a tiny bit from 554,000 up to 563,000 barrels per day, while its natural gas output 
actually climbed up a little bit this time against its terminal decline slope from 7.47 up to 7.54 billion cubic feet per day. And the Niobara Shale out at the base of the Rockies climbed up by a tiny bit as well, up from 757,000 to 765,000 barrels per day, while its natural gas output again remains basically flat at 5.55 billion cubic feet per day. And in billion cubic feet per day, the Barnett Shale, a smaller natural gas shale in northern Texas, over the past couple of months or so has fallen from 2.95 down to 2.91. And in some other oil updates, Norway finished bringing online a large new field out on their mid-continental shelf. And over the past month, that has brought them surging from around 1.5 up to over 1.8 million barrels per day. And we had several monthly oil consumption updates from several nations. Nigeria went up by a little bit. Their oil consumption this month bumping up from 436 to 441,000 barrels per day. Brazil dropped down a little bit. Their oil consumption coming in at 2.37 million barrels per day. Australia fluctuating by a tiny bit, but rounded, still staying right at 1.08 million barrels per day. Turkey dropped by a bit, falling from 1.22 down to 1.18 million barrels per day. Iraq continues slowly climbing back up in consumption, last month getting back up to 700, this month getting back up to 707,000 barrels per day. Ecuador bumping back up to 284,000 barrels per day. And Chile, with everything that's been going on there, took a pretty decent drop in consumption by over a quarter, dropping down to 310,000 barrels per day. And Jamaica, an interesting case, coming in at 30,000 barrels per day, like they usually do. The majority of their small little bit of consumption basically just being a split between jet fuel for flights coming to and from the island and all the diesel fuel being used by the mining vehicles in the Jamaican aluminum mines. As few people know, but that tiny little island is actually a major producer of aluminum, or rather bauxite ore, which is then refined into aluminum. And before we move on into metals, Canadian natural gas storage inventories on the final month at the end of the refill season, definitively below the lowest point of the last six or seven years or so, Coming in this month only at 687 billion cubic feet in storage, compared to the lowest in the last seven years, which was still up at 717. And moving over into metals and other resources, gold continued to fluctuate between $1,450 and $1,500 per ounce. Gold inventories took a jump up from 8.33 up to 8.51 million ounces in storage. Silver continues fluctuating around $17 per ounce. Silver inventories over the course of the week climbed up from 315 million to 317 million ounces in storage before then dropping down to 316 million ounces in storage. Platinum inventories remaining around 163,000 ounces in storage, while platinum prices over the course of the week climbed back up over $900 per ounce and were climbing, but then fell back down to around 900 by the end of the week. Palladium prices recovered over the course of the week, climbing from the uh, 1680s back up towards the 1740s. And as we opened with, rhodium hit $6,000 per ounce. Now the reason for all the high platinum group metal prices, as we've mentioned before, is that numerous countries, China being the biggest one, obviously, are implementing much harsher vehicle emission standards, and the primary source of consumption for the platinum group metals, which includes platinum, palladium, and rhodium, is as catalysts for catalytic converters, those things on the underside of cars which detoxify the exhaust, and as countries are implementing harsher vehicle emission standards, that means they want them to have less toxic exhaust, which means they need more thorough catalytic converters, which will thus then, from this point on, or rather have already been requiring more platinum group metals. Plus, platinum group metal uh, output from platinum group metal mines has basically been flat for the last 10 years. And most of the platinum group metals uh, purely coming out of a single nation, South Africa. You can watch a video about that particular subject up here in the corner, the South Africa problem. And over in the base metals, aluminum inventories climbed upwards again from 1.15 up to 1.17 million tons in storage. 
Aluminum prices correspondingly decreased a little bit more from the 1750s down towards the 1730s in dollars per ton. Nickel prices continued to drop, going down under 15,000, down into the lower and mid 14,000s in dollars per ton, well below where they should be. And nickel inventories actually had a little bit of a gain, going up from 65 to 67,000 tons in storage, while lead inventories remained flat at 67,000 tons in storage. Lead prices still dropped a little bit more from around $2,000 per ton down to between 1960 and 1970. Zinc prices continued tumbling from under $2,400 down to around $2,300 per ton as zinc inventories climbed back up from fifty-four to 59,000 tons in storage. And global copper inventories climbed back up from 1.32 to 1.41 million tons in storage, with copper prices still remaining right at the same level they've been at for a long time, $2.60 or so. And if you want, I just did a video specifically uh, talking about how the inventories and the storage sites and everything work and where the fluctuations and sudden upshoots come from and everything. A link to that will replace the previous link up in the corner. That video just came out yesterday. And ending things with the rare earths. We did not have much movement, only neodymium and terbium really. Neodymium, the critical material for electric motors of all kinds, from regular electric motors to the all-important and rapidly exploding source of consumption, electric vehicle motors. And also heavily critical for, for its other enormous source of consumption, wind turbines. Neodymium took a small drop from $65 down to $64 per kilogram, and terbium needed for all of the same things, as well as being a critical doping material necessary for flash memory and solid state memory, took a drop from $646 down to $639 per kilogram. The recent drops in rare earth metal prices coming from the restart of numerous rare earth metal mines in China. Several of China's rare earth mines had been shut down for environmental safety inspections. Those inspections are over now, and the mines are back up and running. So that's it for this week. I hope everybody enjoyed listening. Please like the video if you enjoyed. Again, subscribe if you're not already, and if you enjoy this kind of stuff. If you want to support me, paypal.me is in the description down below. There's other videos coming up on the screen now that you should really watch. But no matter what, God bless you all, and I will see you all around next time.